Um, we're going to go ahead and record this presentation as we've done with all previous and the two more that are today. And so once uh, um, this is completed, Christine's going to put them online or give you uh, a link to a location where each of the presentations can be downloaded. If you're having trouble downloading those presentations, please send Christine an email and she will uh, send you a B-stick with all of those presentations downloaded. So we do have a recording of everything uh, to look at at your, uh, at your leisure, at your own home computer, online or offline. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bruce. I assume you're going to start the presentation? Yes, yes. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Hello. Bruce Hamaker and, and his team on the Value Added Food Products uh, Project in West Africa. So Bruce? Yep. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, so uh, I will be giving the whole presentation. That's the way we ended up um, um, thinking it would be best and mo most efficient. And then uh, there'll be some input from, uh, from some other people on the line. So just to remind people um, that uh, Mario Ferruzzi is the co-PI at North Carolina State. He's online. Mustafa is the uh, PI for the Niger project and he's online and Sheikh Indai, I don't, don't know that I saw him, but he should be coming online. And Jabril Traore, who is our past um, PI there in, uh, in Senegal. Sheikh, I guess you're, uh, you're online probably. Jabril, probably if that's, I, I see it's being muted, okay. And then, um, and then there's uh, other important people who uh, are not on uh, line, part of the NRAN team. This is really the hub and spoke system, food technologist, Yaye, um, the economist, Yagana nutritionist, and Hamsa communication specialist, and Falu Sar also from, uh, from ITA in Dakar. Uh, let's see, okay. I want to acknowledge an important partner uh, of ours in Niger, that's the McKnight Foundation CCRP project, and uh, particularly the one in Niger. We um, are starting also a new phase of the McKnight project. Mustafa is PI, I'm a co-PI on that project, and Mali now is also included to some degree, as well as Burkina Faso as has been in the past. And to say that uh, the Food Processing and Post-Harvest Innovation Lab, FPIL, uh, does interface with this, uh, with this project and this program, and particularly in the nutrition area. I want to start with um, a report uh, on uh, uh, what's going on in rural Niger uh, in the hub and spoke system, those rural spokes and in the area of what we call and have talked about as market-led nutrition. Again, this is joint with, with the McKnight Foundation. I'm starting with this because I, uh, we think that this um, is, is becoming a, a potentially and hopefully impactful area of the project uh, entering into people's lives, really in the field and on the ground. And I, I hope you see that. And, there's uh, certainly time for questions on this. So, so when we talk about market-led nutrition, we're talking about these things, developing nutritional food products that kids and adults, adolescents, but particularly kids, really want to eat, and then let uh, the market drive nutritional improvement. That's the idea. So it's really uh, interfacing with the market into agriculture and nutrition. It's to support, as you well know, in our project, entrepreneurism and generate income, uh, the hub spoke system to work with entrepreneurs. It's to expand local markets for farmers, of course, and, and it involves very much women empowerment and in this phase of the project, more um, emphasis on youth empowerment. Um, this is the past, I don't wanna spend but a minute on it, other to say that, that this is that hub spoke system that supports and nurtures um, entrepreneurs 
Um, in the rural areas, these rural sites you see in blue, as well as urban entrepreneurs in this, the uh, inner brown circle. And that's really all I wanna say, uh, other than I'm gonna be talking about the Niger ones, Terra to the bottom left, uh, Falwell, I think you can see my cursor, Ghananiya and Shurkan House, uh, and, and really spend a little bit of time on Terra and Falwell. So, in 2017, we um, uh, got into a, a more concentrated focus on nutrition. And uh, from our knowledge and learnings from that FPIL project, because we do uh, you know, lab laboratory and field, but la a lot of laboratory nutrition research, we, uh, and we were developing formulations and have those in that um, innovation lab that, um, that uh, we identified, and Mario really was the lead person in this, Mario Ferruzzi, as well as Yagana, um, who's a nutritionist there at NRAN, of course. Um, different formulations that are nutrient fortified. And here are three of them. There were, I believe, five um, that we, put out there was, uh, so these are nutrient enhanced millet based blends. Uh, they have been identified using millet, uh, improved millet varieties as well as uh, cowpea and peanut improved varieties. This is out of the McKnight Foundation project. And then uh, local plant fortificants that we've been working on, uh, rich in protein and micronutrients. And then we tested these uh, with 320 mothers in a number of different rural sites and showed a preference for these developed blends over food aid corn soy plus blend and and the locally made it's called mazola some of you might be familiar with that millet soy plus blends I'm gonna give you some sales data, but before I do that, I, uh, these are a few um, um, comparisons that Mustafa did. Mustafa Musa um, finished his PhD last fall, graduated in December, and um, these are unreported before. And in fact, some of them were being done in early um, 2019. This is a, a look at some um, basic properties of these blends compared to um, the mazola in this case. So that's a, it's a food aid kind of uh, blend. I say food aid, but, but it, it's sold, but it's sold through health centers. It's different from the other, the, so, the corn soy plus blend is distributed through UNICEF and World Food Program into the health centers. So um, really, all I want to say is that, and this, these were also roast. They're also roasted um, at these rural sites as they're prepared. And um, just to be very brief on this, in this, in this diet, in this uh, um, figure right here, and you can see my cursor. There was a big. So this is a formation of viscosity when you add wheat. Uh, add wheat. I'm sorry. Add heat in a slurry. So there's water, it's, a, it's about a 10% um, uh, formulation flour slurry. And you can see a buildup of viscosity. And these are the different um, fortif fortified and fortified blends. And you can see Mazzolas down here. So it turns out that Mazzola uh, appears to have been overcooked and, and uh, we think that that relates to a relatively low acceptance of these samples. I should, should preface that with saying that the, the preference of these um, formulated fortified blends of ours, um, uh, I mean, we're not out to bash, you know, the food aid at all, but just simply the idea is if they're liked more and they're used more, they're more familiar to people, that, uh, that they will use them more and that kids will eat them more and they'll get better nutrition into their systems. Okay, so go to the next one. This is just another one, basically showing the, the same things, another kind of rheological technique. Won't go into the details, but just to say that the roasted formulation ex exhibited 
greater vis what we call viscoelastic solid property and elasticity uh, than the Mazzola, um, Mazzola blends. Whoa, did um, something happen there? Let's I think you, ex you may have exited out of your um, presentation. Oh, sorry. Okay. Here, let me just get that. That's weird. Um, okay, just a second. Okay, all right, I've got it back and um, let me get that. House to the bottom to share your screen. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Tim. Okay, do people see that? Yep, we're good with you, Bruce. Okay. Perfect. Maybe I just use this forwarding thing down here at the bottom of the screen, probably better. Okay. Um, whoa, there's something about when I go to that slide, it, um, so I'm going to delete that slide, which is, huh. Christine, do we have a copy of Bruce's presentation? Maybe. It's yes, a, I, I, I can put it up. Why don't you let Christine try to load that up and we'll see if we can get past it. Okay. And you can just tell her to advance as needed. Okay, that's fine. Okay. You need to hit that enable editing or no? I mean, maybe not. Uh, remind me where you were uh, Were you here? Uh, it's not on slideshow yet, Chris, uh, Christine. It's not? No. no oh, I have it on slideshow for me. Um, I don't know if that enable editing, but we can, we could go forward like this. Huh. Okay, let's see. Yeah, to me, it is on slideshow. Okay, let me try again. I think that, I don't know if that you need to save it, that enable editing gets in the way sometimes, but maybe not, I don't know. Okay, let's, oh, maybe that's, yeah, let's try that. Okay, okay perfect. Okay, so go to the next slide. Okay, this just to show that iron content of the of the fortified blends uh, from the pro from our project compare well with Mazzola, and the other one is a UNICEF WFP kind of corn soy blend. So it's in that range or higher for iron. Go to the next slide. Um, here's zinc is lower. That's something we have to work on. That's particularly hard to get zinc through natural fortificants, but it is increased anyway, a bit from what we had had. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, and this is product sales. So we've now uh, compiled uh, product sales from 2013. That was the beginning of this project at, with McKnight and into the rural areas and the formation of that hub and spoke into the rural sites and up to uh, 2019, last year's data. And there's some particular things that have happened in the last year that I wanna point out. But before that, let's just quickly walk through, let me walk you through this slide. So um, there's at the bottom, or this is in Falwell, one of the sites. And uh, these are the different um, process products you can see at the bottom. Dege is a large particle, couscous, so there's dege millet, dege sorghum, couscous sorghum. Uh, I'm sorry, couscous millet and couscous sorghum. There's a cowpea couscous, 
And then there's this fortified blend that one of those that we're talking about, and it's the simplest one. Okay, so, and this is um, kilograms of product processed and sold. And you can see a couple things right off the bat that at the beginning of the project, there were four different project products that were made and sold to some degree in 2013. The millet, um, the two millet, Dege millet and Dege couscous, the blue and gray, were a higher volume at that point. You can see over the course of the years through 2019 that there's been a sizable increase in production of some and selling of uh, many of these products. And particularly, you can see um, in 2015, and, um, and forward that there's a good amount of Dege millet uh, that's been processed and sold from this particular site. And Tim, that goes along with, I think, some work that you had done, that T Tabila had done, um, showing that Dege millet has a, has a good, good market um, potential and a good market out there. So let's move. Um, uh, there was in 2015, you see this, they had identified a cowpea couscous, uh, a traditional product in that part of Niger called Barawa. Probably I mispronounced it, but you can see that that, um, that light blue at 2015 uh, already was starting at a pretty good uh, level, about uh, a quarter of a, a ton. And then in 2019, for that product, we're almost up to one metric ton of processing for that site. The other thing, of course, that we're talking about here is the fortified blend. As I said, that was brought in in 2017. There was a little bit processed in 2017, a little bit in 2018, big jump in 2019. It's one of their biggest selling products that's um, at about um, almost 700 kgs of product. Okay, can you go to the next? And this is one other site. I won't go to the other two where the data is uh, um, not as complete, I would say, out in the Maradi, but we see the same things out there. And um, this is Terra, which is close to the um, Burkina border. And uh, it they, um, so I'm not going to go through all, they have more, they have a more diversified group of products. Um, Bass, I would say a few words about these. Uh, you look at the legend at the bottom. Bassi is a millet product with peanuts, peanut butter in it. Uh, babita is a product, and there's millet and sorghum there, and babita is a product actually that was, um, it's an old uh, fermented like pasta product that uh, that was they say virtually almost forgotten about they've revived it and with the help of the hub um, in ran um, uh, innovation food innovation center in Niame they made a protocol of processing with sanitation and everything to make that a commercial product and it's uh, so they make a it's a laborious uh, process, but they, they still make it and sell it. And then there's that Dege millet. And then Dimenity is another, um, it's millet with cowpea. So it's a kind of fortified product. And then there's a forti our fortified blend in the red uh, at the bottom. So we, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see as far as sales go, in terms of, uh, as far as kilograms of products sold, you can see um, that there certainly is a bigger diversification of products as we go along in time from 2013 to 2019. They're producing more different kind of products. And I think the best the thing to look at is 2018, where you see this huge increase with fortified, the fortified blend, um, really up towards one metric ton. And then there's a reduction uh, and, uh, and really all the processed foods for 2019. And perhaps that's due, this is an area of Niger that has security problems near the Burkina border. Mustafa can say later on if that 
might be uh, part of that reason. Okay, next slide. Um, these are the same thing in value of CFA in uh, fall well, I'm not gonna go through it, but just to say in 2019, if you look at that, if you over to the right, that certainly sales and incomes up, they're at over $4,000, which um, may not seem a lot to, to everybody, but they weren't making any money before. And most of these women, this is a women's association of around 40 uh, women, most of them smallholder farmers. Okay, next slide. Christine, can you forward that? Thanks. And this is Tara and uh, the 2018 data, I had questions about, so we didn't put it on, um, but that you can see um, also an increase, particularly again in this fortified flower blend. So that's the real story. Uh, there's a couple stories here, but it, a big one is that the fortified flower blends have taken off. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that's, uh, there's been a concerted effort to get out the word on those. The, the, uh, there's um, with uh, Yagana who works, who is from the Ministry of Health and is assigned to this uh, group at NRAN, that what we call the Hub Food Process, Food Innovation uh, laboratory hub. Um, they, she um, has close ties and works through the works with the health centers. And the health centers, they a lot of times don't even have the food aid, the WFP food aid. And so they um, are all the health. Uh, the health centers are referring people to the innovation centers, the spokes, um, to buy this food when when there's that need. There's also radio coverage. This is Hamsa, the communication specialist. It's a very, a very important part of this. So there's radio broadcasts. I won't go into the detail, but just to say there's radio broadcasts, rural radio broadcasts about markets, about the health center, availability of these products, what the products mean. In, um, in Fallwell, um, World Food Program has um, recently contracted that group to, to uh, make uh, 3 million uh, CFA, that's around $5,000 of fortified products for WFP to distribute in schools in that region. Next slide. So we um, are really seeing what we think is a promising model uh, for delivery of nutrition to children. Okay, I'm sorry, this is my only slide with, anim with animation. So we see a large increase again in sales of fortified flower blends in 2018 and 19. Next one. The rural health centers again are partnering with the Spoke Food Innovation Centers uh, to provide fortified flower blends. There's training that's naturally occurring and then sometimes supported by the hub to surrounding communities to the spokes. We think that's very important. It's happening, it really happened organically starting about two, three years ago where the women associations took it upon their own initiative to begin to um, reach out to women from other communities in those regions and to bring them in or to go there and to train them on processing and more recently, of course, this is into the nutri nutritionally enhanced or fortified flower blends. Next one. I talked about the rural, the rural radios we think is an important aspect of this. Um, yeah, sorry, next one. Sorry. How did that happen? Um, and uh, I, and Mara D, um, I didn't mention this, the Shirkin House has spoke, provides Dakawa, that's a, kind of um, peanut millet kind of um, uh, food blend that's popular also in northern Nigeria um, to, a, to a school there. Um, and then in fall while I mentioned that. Okay, go ahead. Well, this is just to show there's been a lot of, uh, a good amount of training. This is in 2019, June and July. This is um, training with the help of the hub uh, people into 
um, surrounding villages. I believe this is in the um, Maradi area, and I think it's Shirkin House. Uh, so the so again, this is um, that these blue rural hubs you see in the center are um, sort of naturally, but with the help of the hub spoke system, also expanding um, the reach of these these um, activities and technologies. Go ahead. Okay, I'll move on then from that. And um, I want to uh, also sort of quickly, because I, I don't want to spend too much time on any one thing, but um, the, the, uh, we, the uh, Niger project, um, Mustafa had, um, had uh, we'd set up uh, and Mustafa had implemented over uh, 2018 mostly, a uh, market study, a, a home use study, and a market study. And um, then in the last year, 2019, that this data hasn't been presented, and I'm just presenting a very little bit of it, um, but um, there's some promising results from those studies um, that were reported in his thesis, and, and, um, and in 2019, the data was uh, analyzed and then assessed. So, this is on um, instant millet products. You re remember that, that the project gave an extruder, put in an extruder in the hub at Inran, and um, that extruder makes instant um, products, instant flour products, I should say. And there's some different ones. There's a four or five different ones. Also, uh, there's a couscous product made out that I've reported on before, we've talked about before, I'm not going to say anything about it on this, on this report. But um, this is on two, uh, there's the, these two studies into the community, into the Niame urban area, um, are on tuo, which is the thick porridge that's eaten, it's called to and Mali. many of you are familiar with that, thick millet porridge. And fura is a thin type of porridge. It's not, not any kind of thin porridge. It's a specific kind. At the bottom, you can see um, that. I won't go into it, but there is, it's, a, it's a laborious prod, uh, process. That being more laborious than tuo, but still tuo, um, ta is, it takes some time to make it. So the idea is that instant products that really one just uh, reconstitutes with water and takes uh, not more than some minutes um, would be um, advantageous and convenience food that urban um, consumers would want. Okay, so go ahead. Um, so unfortunately, um, I can't, I have a strip, Christine, that's, that's hiding the right part of the screen. I wonder if I can get that off of here. Um, I don't think so. Um, so I can't read that, that what's, what's on Bruce, if you've got some boxes, you can drag them off or you can minimize them. Okay. Oh, oh, there. Uh, thank you. I see. I got it. Okay. So this was a rheological test. It shows that instant tool has a lower, um, elasticity than the corresponding controls. We were, Mustafa was really looking at basic properties of these compared to the traditional, right? Not much difference, but somewhat less uh, what we call elasticity of that thick porridge. Okay, next slide. The thin fura that, um, that the instant fura has somewhat higher elasticity compared to the traditional fura. Next slide. Um, this one that the instant and traditionally par prepared two porridges were strong viscoelastic gels. That's an important property, right? That it, they're very similar to the traditional, okay? And finally, that the instant fura um, has a kind of property that uh, uh, suggests a, strong, a stronger gelled paste uh, property than uh, than the um, traditionally prepared fur. So there's some differences there. And we'll look at in the next uh, couple slides what that means in at the next, this slide in terms of consumer preference. So this one um, is a home use study and it just really shows it's broken down, disaggregated between males and females. There's a lot of 
different ways to disaggregate this data, and I'm only going to show this. Mustafa has quite a bit of data behind this. But anyway, it's showing that on uh, by and large, we're getting around um, three and a half to four um, in the hedonic scale for overall acceptability, which is the y-axis. So that's quite good. That's uh, very acceptable for these kind of uh, por porridges, uh, thick on the left side, thin on the right side. Okay, next slide. And just to say that the consumers in this home use uh, test really did find an advantage uh, at, that they're very easy to, to uh, prepare, and they are. They're, and, and that was the purpose of having them take them home and use them because it's one thing to describe or even demonstrate what an instant, what's the advantage of an instant, um, you know, flower uh, for thicker, th thin porridges um, as here, but rather uh, opposed to taking them home. Okay, Christine. Then the market test study, there was about two and a half metric tons of these two products that were put out into the market and tracked for 20 weeks. Now, the, I say 20 weeks, but uh, really at around um, 12 weeks, I think it was, that, uh, that they were selling more, uh, they, they couldn't supply enough to meet the demand. So really our data, um, our data sort of stops at 12 weeks, but that's still a good amount of time where we have uh, plenty of product to sell in the market. Okay, go ahead. This was done through the processing association that uh, was set up a long time ago, back in the uh, 2000s, with uh, women process, well, any, any processor, but they're mostly women in the Niame area. And there were six uh, processors who were successful processors who agreed to be part of this project and to distribute uh, the products into their selling points. And on the, uh, on the right, I would just comment that that's uh, the woman who's standing in front is Madame Liman, who has, um, with the help of the, the, uh, the center in Rand, the hub, um, has, uh, has, is, is quite successful and about two years ago got a $180,000 grant from UK Aid to expand her processing unit. And she's really, uh, the women really work together uh, very well. Mario and I were just there in late February, the third week of February, where we had a workshop uh, with these women and met with the uh, rural, um, with representatives, the head people from the rural sites also, two from each side. Okay, next slide. Um, in the left figure, this is at, um, this is a compilation of all the data over the weeks. And these are products on the x-axis that different entrepreneurs, those uh, that are, I don't know if it's those six or if it's the whole group. Um, it must be the six because these are the ones that are tracked, right? So these are products that they sell into the market, the Niame market. And you can see the highest one there is de, a millet dege. It's in French, dege de mil. That's the one that's the highest bar on the left side. And the ones that um, after 20 weeks, this is again a compilation of all sales. And you can see with the red arrows that these are the instant thick porridge uh, on the left and the instant thin porridge, the one that has the sort of sideway bars within it. So that there, so showing that uh, consumers um, really did start buying these products and they became quite popular. And as we met with them in February, there's many uh, processors that want to want this technology and trying to figure out with with um, with the project and with Enran how we can move forward to position them to get this kind of extrusion technology. Okay, next slide. So summary, um, there were porridge flowers um, sold by processor partners 
uh, for 20 weeks in five locations at 30 sales sites. I mentioned there are 2.5 metric tons of instant porridge flour. So that was one metric ton of instant tuo, 1.5 metric tons of instant fura. And uh, that's the amount that was sold in CFA and that these two products at the bottom accounted for one third of the total sales of all 35 cereal products sold. Okay, next slide. This is just to show you Madame Limon, that same woman who got the UK aid grant. That's a large dryer there on the photo next to her that was acquired through that. And I think important to note that she has packaging equipment you see in the two right um, photos. Um, and she has agreed, um, because this is really so, she's, she's really an incubate, incubatee really of the system. And she's very closely tied in. And she has, uh, in the next uh, year we will start, she's going to allow that process, that packaging equipment to be used and that the project is supplying right now the packaging material and that other processors in the AME can start using that uh, with different, with, uh, with different, you know, uh, not the same um, labeling as she has. Okay, Senegal project. So we have three things to report. Um, uh, sensory evaluation capacity building, uh, fermented economic couscous. There's been quite a bit of work done on the lactic acid bacteria culture, and then a good amount of work done on uh, what's instant arau. I'll talk about that. Arau is a fat is a is a very popular product in um, in Senegal made from millet. It's a kind of little um, rounded sort of elongated particles that are that that's a raw product that's then cooked. Um, and this is an instant around. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm not going to get into, but I think it's good to put it in the slides um, and Sheck had put these in and Mario had gone over and myself. It, just what, what it, the importance of having sensory science capacity is quite big. This we think will be one of the leading sensory science um, facilities in West Africa. And as you can imagine, those of you who aren't close to it, but you can still imagine that um, interacting and understanding how foods are accepted by consumers is so critical when one is trying to then go through the final stages of development of those products and get the market to drive them. Sort of what we were talking about in Niger with those uh, fortified blends that we went through a sensory analysis with 320 mothers, but this is a formal kind of, a more formal kind of uh, facility and it's, um, and it's funded through the project. So next slide. Um, so just at the, at the middle to, be, to build a best in class capacity and to support the construction and outfitting of a new sensory laboratory at ITA Dakar, enable human capacity building through training and certification in sensory science uh, through ITA, and apply sensory science to ongoing development projects within SMIL and private sector uh, partners. And part of that, um, that uh, training Sheck uh, himself will uh, who's the PI there and uh, for the Senegal project for SMIL, will um, go through a training that UC Davis um, offers. It's an online training. He won't go to California, but it's quite extensive and rigorous, and he'll be certified through that, pro uh, that, uh, that training. Okay, next slide. Here's uh, in the last year, um, then, um, so uh, funds were received uh, kind of late for SMIL, but we did have carry forward funds uh, from phase one and that started this off and then it's been um, furthered in the last actually even couple months. So this is at the stage uh, they're at. And uh, Sheck says that within the next month that uh, hopefully coronavirus uh, 
doesn't interfere with that, but certainly could. But anyway, we're very close to having this finished. Okay, check. I mean, next slide. Uh, economic couscous. Economic couscous was something that came out of the Insermill project and then was still worked on in uh, the first phase of SMIL in Senegal. It's a, it's a kind of a commercial couscous uh, process that is cheaper. I won't go into the details. I've talked about it before. But right now, the um, effort, the activity is around fermentation because the, the big processors, what we might call medium scale here, that, uh, that they work with in, in uh, the Dakar area and it through in the Smil project, um, they are asking for fermented. That's a very popular kind of couscous in Senegal that's fermented. So that's a lactic acid bacterial fermentation. And so there's, uh, uh, there's been some work and then it's uh, increased in 2019 to isolate beneficial lactic acid bacteria from millet flour, characterize their potential to enhance the quality of economic couscous products. Next slide. I'm not going to go into the details. Sheck maybe later on might say a few more words about this, but have identified different uh, lactic acid bacteria. Go forward. And um, these are uh, screening of millet samples purchased in the marketplace and a description of those different, um, those different isolates. Go ahead. Um, importantly, in the last year, through uh, a, um, a collaborator re relationship that Mario Ferruzzi has, there's been a strong um, partnership that's grown with a group in Italy. This is Dr. Paola Mario. I butcher this name, I'm sure. Laver Mikosa. I'm Coca. Anyway, I'm, I know that's not right, but anyway, that they. Um, that they are aiding ITA in the advancement of economic couscous product through the characterization of acidification performance for selected cultures suitable for fermentation of millet, because it's really about the acid, you know, um, the acid production. Um, that has, uh, has become a really um, uh, good collaboration I, I mentioned and uh, even to the point of identifying another uh, very good guidance and advice, I would say. I've learned this through Mario and Sheck, but, but um, you know, how that really the focus needs to be on commercialization of a lactic acid um, bacterial culture. And, uh, you know, as fast as, as soon as possible. So they, um, Sheck and with Mario too, and the group in Italy, they've written a small grant a proposal to a French group to get some equipment that's necessary for that kind of commercialization of the culture, which is really a freeze dryer to my understanding. Okay, next slide. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is the uh, Rao. And uh, a constraint on a row is the preparation time. It's around 37 minutes, according to their studies, uh, previous study there at uh, ITA. The objective of this activity was to reduce cooking time for better positioning of millet around in Senegal and external markets. And uh, the problem with an ex uh, instant extruded millet product, a uh, flour product, a row, was that it was uh, falling apart too soon when it was cooked. And so it wasn't making a good uh, product. I reported that we reported on this in uh, the last year, 2018, sort of the beginning of this, but uh, other work has been done in 2019. And they've really uh, come to um, a better place on what's needed. And these are two um, kind of hydrocolloids there in parentheses, a maltodextrin and gum arabic. Um, that are can you, that they've used to bind those particles, those which are pre-cooked. The instant, of course, is pre-cooked uh, flour particles to bind them into good arrow that 
that produces a good product and remains as granules after cooking. Okay, next slide. Um, so I think we'll just go on. These are different formulations. They went through a, a study last year. Go ahead. Um, same thing here. We won't spend time on on it, but they were getting very good granules after cooking. Was is the is the um, thing? And Shaq, you can tell later, but I think that the cooking time uh, is around five minutes compared to the 37. Um, they also have done work on reducing phytate in cow peas using an acid medium um, then that uh, to go towards cow pea. Cow pea has a fairly high amount of phytate and to go into blends of sorghum and millet. And they also have done work on whole grain fiber um, content in millet products that I'm not presenting here. Okay, next slide. Here's just very briefly some other 2019 project outputs, um, some publications and manuscripts. Uh, I'm not, the manuscripts to be submitted, there's a couscous manuscript from Mustafa that we're, I hope to get it in actually last week, but uh, it'll be going in next week. And then uh, one of our uh, purposes there in Niger um, last month in the third week of February. Um, we met with the, as I mentioned, we met with the uh, representatives from the spokes, two from each spoke, and we spent uh, two days actually going over data, a lot more than I showed, uh, and putting together the framework for a paper which we're now compiling. So that's a not a not I shouldn't put a really put hub and spoke. It's the nutritional aspect that I covered in the first um, part of this presentation. That we're working towards a publication in that that we want to get out um, as soon as possible. I'm going to talk a little bit about graduate training. We had that workshop in February. I already mentioned it, and then there's some other Niger workshops. Uh, and there's been other trainings with the entrepreneurs in Dakar, which are which uh, I'm not going to cover. Okay, go ahead. Here's just uh, two pap our two papers that were published last year. This is out of Mario's group. It's on carotenoids. This is Howie DeBello, who was uh, funded in part uh, going back. This is before. This is from phase one, obviously, but was published last year. It's on uh, carotenoid bioaccessibility and millet porridges. The next slide. This is out of my group. It's on um, some work we had done and published um, out of uh, Ensor Mill and then published um, during the Smill with, with credit to Smill um, in the phase one, showing that um, millet products, uh, couscous and thick porridge, have slow gas stomach emptying, very slow stomach emptying. This was in Mali and, and, um, and provides satiety to people, sort of energy, uh, extended energy after one eats uh, those products and a feeling of fullness. And this was a study that Anna Hayes did who was partially supported at one point in phase uh, one. Mostly this was with laboratory supplies but uh, there was a, a small period where she was, um, she had half of her assistantship supported by um, Smill. And she um, has this, and she has another study, uh, another paper that will be coming out probably later this year. This was on uh, um, pearl millet couscous and uh, using a human gastric simulator at, uh, at UC Davis, but then a bulk of the work was done at Purdue. And I just would say in the right hand corner, upper right hand corner, it was the cover of that issue uh, in uh, early 2020 in the journal Food and Function, which Mario is one of the associate editors of. It's a, it's a very good um, journal, high, high level journal in our area. Okay, go ahead. Graduate students, uh, we have uh, in this phase, we don't have graduate students in the US. Um, we're really 
um, coordination, support, running the project from here. At Purdue, uh, Mustafa was my last graduate student. And Mario has uh, a minor amount of support for Howie DeBello, who is um, a postdoc in his laboratory to support the project. The, the emphasis, the focus is on um, student um, support and work there in Niger and Senegal. And not to go over every name, but just to say that um, part of the pro project going forward and then what, it, what we're um, working towards right here is getting um, university students in Niger, that's what those um, Mokhtar Alafaz and a female student, and then uh, it's mentioned, Mustafa mentions five to 10 young entrepreneurs who will be incubated in the hub as particularly the first two for a long period of time, I think it's a whole year, and who have expressed interest in starting businesses. And so it's really to bring people in in a different way into even graduate work, but it's towards entrepreneurism. And in Senegal, same kind of thing. You'll notice um, Abdurrahman, Abdurrahman Diop was a student in the first phase of the um, project. He's an economist, so he's in economics. He's not in our area, but he's worked a lot with uh, ITA and he will continue to do his PhD and interface with ITA in the area of commercialization. Here's some other students in their projects. Next slide. I think just to go quickly, this is from Mustafa had, uh, um, uh, there was a first international millet symposium hosted by the first lady, the president's wife. And um, that was in February, 2019. And if I understand right, there was one that just happened or will happen very soon where Mustafa will be a large part of that. And uh, the president's uh, first wife in Niger actually is a, um, a first cousin of a former student of ours and person, Adam Abubakar, who we worked with starting this hub spoke system years ago. Um, the second one is an inception meeting in March 2019. We all know that. Next slide. Here's a workshop um, in Ghana that Mustafa presented. Um, the what's what we're doing in the project. Next slide. Future planning uh, for 2020. Okay, next slide. Um, for traditional and new project concepts, there are, uh, Niger is uh, working right now on two co-extruded couscous product products. One's called Tusme, the other one Lacquery. Um, Senegal, there's be a uh, further optimization of the instant aral, including sensory testing with the Dakar processors and trying to move that out into the commercial area, as well as the same with economic couscous is fermented that we've been talking about, but still there's work on the fermentation part of that. There's packaging work that will be done and in both places in Senegal, there's uh, ITA is setting up really what will be a packaging center. They have a packaging uh, machine that was in disrepair, but, um, but is being fixed with just a little bit of input from our side. And um, it's, it will be a very important uh, part of working with entrepreneurs and getting good packaging, really important. I mentioned what's gonna, ha what's gonna happen in Niger that uh, Madame Limon is going to allow her packaging equipment to be used. Shelf life assessment studies will begin, that sensory lab will be finished and, and Sheck will take his um, certification through UC Davis. Go ahead. Um, there'll be continued support of urban and rural entrepreneurs in Niger. Um, with a greater emphasis on training of youth in the urban area and I guess a really and rural area. There's a setting up that's in this phase uh, to use the processing facility and the extruder on a fee basis um, to move towards at least some um, uh, degree of sustainability. I mean, this is a government uh, part of, you know, NRAN. So they, and it's a, it's a, it's kind of a showcase um, uh, group in, in RAND. So it's, it's supported by the government, but we need to 
uh, explore ways to get money coming in. They've done this before, but this will be done in a little bit different way, and it will include more advanced technologies like the, like the extruder. And to assist entrepreneurs for loans and grants with work plans, been done in the past, but greater emphasis now. Um, there'll be training in the rural areas for the secondary sites, sort of an expansion of that, and improvement in the fortified flower blends. That goes to the next slide and last slide on this. Go ahead. Um, for the nutritional status improvement part of the project, which is again a joint with McKnight Foundation. Um, I don't want to go through the details of that, but there are two parts. If you go to the lower bullets, there's a quantitative preference test for improved nutrient fortified blends uh, compared to food aid and then a nutritional six month nutritional impact study that will compare our blend, our best blend that is in this case is matched, which the other one was not, I have to say, matched for micronutrients, protein content, you know, nutrient fortification with the food aid uh, blends. And, um, and no, can just hold that just for a second. And there will, uh, so we will uh, be further developing that study design. We, we talked quite a bit about that. We worked on that really in February and submission of IRB documents uh, will be this, um, probably this, um, I, we were thinking this spring, but I imagine it will go into probably June, July, okay? And the final slide is uh, on contingencies. We were asked to talk, say something about and COVID-19 adaptation strategies. Um, for that last, for the, um, um, the, the, uh, stu the nutritional study, clinical study, field study in Niger, um, you know, we have to have a contingency plan there. So we will have a meet meeting, it'll be a web meeting with partners to consider what activity would replace a Niger clinical study if we weren't able to do that due to COVID-19. Um, we hope that's really scheduled into year three, but it's at the beginning of year three. So um, it's coming up and uh, we have to just think well about that. And, and Tim and the group there in Kansas State to, to discuss that with you. And then the last, the, the other thing is the Niger security issue um, we certainly hope that doesn't um, worsen, but we're, you know, we're aware and Mustafa uh, keeps us updated on that. It has affected, well, as I mentioned, that site near, um, near uh, Burkina Faso, but they're still quite active. And, and Fure, Fure, who's the head of that group, uh, just went to the McKnight meeting in Montpellier uh, just last month, or the beginning of this month. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Okay, let's open up the um, uh, questions at this time for Bruce and his team. Um, I see a question that's uh, already been typed in by Peter Matlin. Do you wanna go ahead and start us off with that, Peter? Yeah, uh, Bruce, thanks again for uh, what I always find a really interesting uh, presentation and work. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the really impressive early sales that uh, you reported on with Instant Tool and Fura, and uh, where you were going to shoot for 20 months of sales, but you're already running out of uh, product um, by after 12 months. My question is, how were the products being priced in the market? Uh, did they fully account for all of the costing of all of the inputs, including labor time and, and so forth? Um, and um, uh, well, I think you get you get the point. Uh, were there any yeah. subsidies included that uh, yeah. that may have accounted for these sales? Because it really is a market decision that consumers are making. Yeah, yeah, that's a really really important question. It was something we we discussed and found a, a we determined a pricing at the beginning, and honestly, I don't remember the details of that. Mustafa, can you comment? But, but perhaps to your point, microphone. 
perhaps to your point, Peter, that it was, we just didn't uh, price it high enough. But as far as covering, you know, it was made in the, uh, we're aware of, uh, and, and, you know, we are aware, but we've not done a rigorous, we, we've not done a rigorous evaluation, but we've done evaluation of, you know, how much it costs electricity and that kind of thing to produce uh, products. But of course, the extruder is sitting there in the hub too. Right, and and that would have to be uh, fully costed. If if what yeah. your your introductory comments suggested, you're looking at a market driven approach to improved uh, uh, nutrition enhanced products, and uh, so one has to do a uh, business analysis of what would it require for a businessman to be able to produce and market this, and right. to achieve the kind of sales uh, that that you are looking at. Yeah, you're right. I, I do want to point out, uh, Peter, that those rural, those fortified blends are not extruded. They're not instant. Those are, those are roasted and uh, using a very simple kind of technology. Um, right, but not the urban products, right? Those but, but even that, you're right. In every case, no, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's really critical, isn't it? Mustafa, can you unmute your yes. mi microphone? Okay, yeah. Thank you, Bruce and Berhani. So actually about the pricing for the instant uh, Pura and Tuo, uh, first we join the survey, the first part of the survey, I mean the home use, we had uh, a kind of willingness to pay data that were not presented where they estimated the cost at the household. Then we came back, we had a meeting with the rural, uh, the urban processors, and uh, we agreed to sell the product uh, at the range of sales of the, the product that, uh, that they are currently selling in those sales stores, like the Dege, the Couscous. So the, the, the price was just estimated as the product was made by those uh, urban women, and then they propose the product at the same stores, and the consumers are coming to buy it according to those, uh, the price of the similar uh, uh, alternative product. And uh, that's the way they, they sell it, and they had the profit just as their existing uh, product. But they had a premium, of uh, I think 100 franc on uh, all the extruded product. And uh, the product were uh, sold like that. And for the urban, uh, for the rural area, the 45 product, they estimated the, the cost according to what they are uh, having as input from the grain they are uh, growing and also the uh, supplies like the plastic they are buying and they have a pricing system and they are uh, getting profit uh, I think if you remember Bruce of uh, about uh, 250 francs CFA on each uh, uh, package at some point they even had to reduce the profit because they have noticed that it was too much though the uh, food innovation centers was uh, uh, supported in terms of funding uh, through the Mac Knight project. So they have the equipment, the facilities, and uh, the operation uh, is doing from what they are getting as profit, and they share the, the cost according to the supplies they have, and also the labor, the contribution of each of them, and how they can also share the profit. So uh, to come to the economic analysis, I think this is uh, something critical that we can do uh, for the extruder product. Once we had an extruder, maybe pl uh, uh, placed in a real commercial uh, situation, like uh, in a unit of people like Madame Liman, then we can really uh, track that estimate uh, of the cost 
and get a price that corresponds to the uh, exact uh, investment. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Bettina, would you like to go ahead and ask a couple of questions? Yes. So thank you very much, Bruce and team. One thing I was wondering whether you are now monitoring the aflatoxins, especially in the food products that contain groundnut. Yeah, um, that's in the that's in this phase in both in the in the McKnight um, as well as it's mentioned in the Smil. Um, what my understanding and we Mustafa when we started using peanut, they do train the women to with a blanching technique, you know, to remove those that um, any peanuts that you know turn dark brown and a blanching, you know, that, that, that means they potentially have aflatoxin. But we've not, uh, to my knowledge, started, and I'm glad you brought it up, the actual screening at, or testing for afl aflatoxin. I think not. But we are, are careful in that way, you know, of doing that blanching. Um, I think it would still be good to monitor this, yeah, to know right. what is in, since you're you are right. promoting this also to young kids. Yeah, we will do. Thank you. Yeah, and my other question was whether there are formal contracts in place for quality grain yes. production between the pro processor groups and the farmers. Yeah, I'll let Mustafa take that. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Bettina, for your two questions. Wait, for the <laughs> yeah, merci. For the aflatoxin, as mentioned, we have planned to do this work on uh, Mac Knight, and uh, right now is because of the the situation of the virus. We were planning to travel to have the sampling of their respective product and start uh, the testing, and is going to be also. Uh, done uh, conjointly with uh, the activities we are conducting in uh, Burkina and also will involve uh, Urdu University and uh, North Carolina State University on that aspect of uh, aflatoxin because it is really critical. They are selling the product. We gave them a lot of training on food safety and uh, we still need to track the amount of afl aflatoxin as part of the activities in this uh, new phase in, uh, in Mac Knight. And for the sales of the grain, all the grains they are uh, using both in uh, the urban and rural area are uh, improved varieties. Because uh, like uh, if we take Madame Liman, she has a, a contract through the UK aid and some other uh, activities with uh, Moriban and uh, also in, uh, in Maradi with uh, 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 Uma Gaskiamor, especially in uh, Seki Hausa and uh, I think uh, also in another village. I forget that uh, the name of that village. But they know all the varieties they, they, they need for specific products uh, that they are uh, uh, processing in uh, in, in Nyame and in the village also all the improved varieties and uh, the other varieties are from uh, the farmer union which are all linked to either Inran or uh, Ikrisat for those activities. Thank you. Uh, follow Thank up you. at all Bettina or are you good with that? I'm fine. Okay. the time. <laughs> okay, I'd like to go to um, uh, Barbara's asking a question about aflatoxins in peanuts. Um, do you have any information about the effect of fermentation on aflatoxins? She says that there's very limited amounts of uh, very few papers that are available uh, with contradictory uh, results. Uh, Barbara, anything to add to that question? No, it's being actively pursued, and it's not actually only these two papers that contradict, but it 
It may be the strain of bacteria being used. I'm not sure what uh, results in so much um, difference in results in these studies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, uh, Barbara, the answer to that. I mean, we that's something perhaps they could do in in uh, in Senegal because Jabril, I see he wrote wrote a chat message too. I mean that they've done they have a student, um, Elias DMA, who has worked on aflatoxin and processing. Though I don't think he's worked. I, I know he's not worked on fermentation, but um, perhaps we could look at that. Bruce, it's I've a good question. It's a good question. So Bruce, it's in, and, and Barbara, it's a really excellent question. It's uh, about seven or eight years ago, we had some work with uh, a colleague who came from Mexico looking at uh, bacterial strains for aflatoxin metabolism through fermentation of dairy products. So they were interested in, in M1, which is the kind of ruminant product and metabolite you see in milk as it gets in from the grain. And uh, they found good success, but he had done in his, own, I think it was from the Polytechnico of Monterey, they had done quite a bit of work on identifying specific strains of lactic acid bacteria. So that could be part of the, the issue out there is what strains of, of lactic acid bacteria are best suited to grains may not necessarily be giving the same activity, but that's something that, you know, again, through Senegal and I know that they've done some uh, quite a bit of work of this uh, at ISPA, the Italian lab that the Dakar now has a connection to. They have a huge aflatoxin lab there. Uh, that Sheck, uh, we may want to follow up with them. They probably already have some insight into some of these strains. We could add that as a criteria for discussion in selection. So that that's a really excellent point. I'm I'm really thrilled to hear that. It's, I think that's a good op opportunity to perhaps synergize a couple of functionalities. Great. Uh, Barbara, would you, while you're on the uh, spot right now, would you like to follow up with your uh, second question? Uh, sure. And I actually have then still another one. These are Okay, very, go ahead, Barbara. Um, so the, the clinical trial, I noticed, you know, uh, obviously it may be slowed down, but you're going to look at children two to five years of age. And I, my comment is that by two to five years of age, they're growing so much more slowly than they are at one to two. And if you're testing with some kind of porridge, you might uh, be better able to measure a change if you looked at a younger age group. So that's, that's just a comment. Yeah. Then I was really interested in phytate reduction work because um, many of products that we've looked at in Ethiopia, there's plenty of zinc there. It's just not bioavailable. And so if phytate reduction might be a lot easier than trying to, to breed a change in, in the grain. So that's all comments really. But um, I, if, if someone's doing more phytate reduction work, I would be really interested in knowing more about it. Thank you, Barbara, for your comments, for both of them. And we will, um, I know we talked about this last uh, year, and you, I think you brought this up to about the one to two years. And um, we will revisit that, uh, Mario and I and the group, when we, when we uh, get into detailed design. We might come back to you with some questions on it. That's fine. And just to jump backwards, Jabril has a comment in that he has got a student working on aflatoxin control through um, addition of sodium bicarbonate and sodium citrate. So we look forward to any um, information you find on that. Mm -hmm. Other questions, uh, Barbara, you, you, you had a question about the, the clinical study. So why don't we let you take oh, off? Oh, that, that's really related to the age of the, the participants, you know, one to two years versus older. So that was the question. So it, we're already done. Okay, great. Other questions from the group? Yeah, Tim, 
Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'd put another one into the chat box, and this was uh, related to some comments that uh, Bruce made with respect to some packaging work that they're going to be starting. And uh, uh, it's a, just really a comment, possibly recommendation, that when you are working on, on packaging approaches, it might be valuable to bring in uh, uh, individuals primarily from the private sector with expertise in marketing and advertisement to help you determine what are the most effective branding uh, strategies that you might use. And this would include uh, selection of, of colors and images and messages that you might want to convey on the packages. It's been found to be effective when uh, promoting uh, locally produced uh, products uh, uh, elsewhere in West Africa, it may well work here. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And then maybe one other question, and this is with respect to what Bruce reported on the rural studies in Falwell and, and uh, Terra. Terra, mm -hmm. right. In Falwell, it was clear that the sales were going up for, for most of the products, some more than others, but for most of the products. In Terra, with the exception of the fortified flour, the the sales were really going down. To me, you you didn't report it that way, but from looking at the numbers, it appeared mm -hmm. to me that they were either stagnant or declining. And the question is why? And yeah. and I ask that more from a research perspective that there may be uh, a lot to learn by comparing the Falwell and Terra. Uh, cases with the differences in promotion did they have difficulties in quality mm -hmm. control were there different markets uh, in terms of the consumers and it's these kinds of differences that uh, can generate a lot of uh, valuable uh, lessons uh, for the future mm -hmm. yeah thanks for your comment I you know I wondered the same thing and I, I sort of uh, that Babita product in particular they had a kind of rise and then it went went quite a ways down and I wondered if that's in that case is not uh, connected with it being such a laborious process to make the thing it's like a two three day thing to you know uh, process to make it and that they these um, fortified flowers you know they just roast it and they grind you know mill it and so forth is easier. I don't know if it has to do with that. Mustafa, do you have any comment? Yeah, really, I think uh, from what I hear from uh, Ure and the other women during our meeting in February, they are more uh, focusing on uh, fortified products, more especially the, the, the flower for the children and uh, the giminti, which is the couscous and the peanut and uh, also the dakwa so they, they, they have uh, like uh, more focus on uh, on those products than uh, the other product maybe that could be one of the the reason of this and uh, i also wanted to and even yesterday i think we talked about it yesterday uh, bruce they have we have some additional uh, data which we are also going to compile with my group about the the sales uh, that were not reported uh, in this, uh, as mentioned by uh, uh, Fure. So I think those are the two reasons, but I can really uh, ensure that they are making more fortified products than the other products. So Mustafa, why did they decide to shift their focus towards the fortified products? because they have more market uh, from the health centers there is no uh, we have some data on accessibility of the product we reported in mac Knight. Uh, so uh, they, like their product is more accessible to the mothers than uh, the the product sent to the health centers by food aid more especially the the the, uh, the flour uh, made with soy maize and also uh, the products from Mizola. They are not accessible sometimes and the children don't want them. So they have two uh, problems on that. Well, their product is produced on daily basis and the mothers can get it at any time. They just 
when they come to the centers, they can just produce and give it to them. So they are really seeing an increase in demand and also the radio, uh, rural radio have really activated the, the sales uh, from the weekly market. So there are many people coming from those markets and ask for the product and also the feeding school. So they are seeing, I think, more opportunities in the fortified product. Okay, primarily because of government and institutional and aid interventions. Okay, very good, thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Other questions from the, from the audience? Either raise your hand or contribute through the chat box. Yes, I just added uh, one question. Did he know you, whether you could you elaborate a bit more on the training of young people done in the project? Because I think in the West African context, it's very important to associate young people and give them a perspective for the future. So I was wondering how many people were trained and what was the effect of the training? Did some start a small business and what are your future plans on this? Yeah, thanks, Patina. I'm going to let Mustafa uh, say, but I would before that I'd just say that that this was uh, noted in the la in phase one, especially in the um, in Niger anyway, in the Niame market, that they're mostly older uh, women who are running these businesses, and so in phase two, it's there's a specific uh, activity that I talked a little bit about to br to bring in young people, young people who want to sort of embrace technology uh, to some extent and, and to learn how to uh, process high quality foods and to start businesses. So that's that idea of bringing, um, bringing young people right into the center um, to, to do that. And the rural side, Mustafa will have to say, I, I know that there's been, even before this, uh, this phase that there was some emphasis to bring in towards the latter part of maybe a couple years ago to bring in young women into those groups. But Mustafa, you want to say a few words? Yes, thank you, uh, Bettina and Bruce for your question and comment on the involvement of uh, young people in the activities. So in uh, the cities, we have started to see a shift because we have more and more interest more especially the young women. Uh, even uh, during the Millet Symposium, we have noticed it last year and also this year. Uh, they are more interested in uh, uses and diversification of millet, uh, cowpea, and uh, the other grain. And also some of them already are food scientists or nutritionists. So they have some background and uh, they are uh, developing some business plan and also having some product and most were incubated in the in uh, our centers in one way or another and there are some uh, possibilities of helping them to prepare a business plan and also a plan a technology plan to go in the processing of those uh, products in uh, in Niamey and also in other cities of uh, Niger and then we have uh, at the rural site a lot of interest, more especially from the regional authorities who are sending the, the youth, more especially women groups in all the spoke. And uh, we have uh, presented some of those, more especially in Falwell and also in uh, Dera and, uh, and Maradi. So they are coming and uh, they, they trend them like last year, they were about, uh, uh, getting to a hundred that came uh, sporadically, sometimes they came 20, 30 from uh, a given location and they stay, they sleep at the incubation centers, they get all the way of doing the work and uh, we used to go and spend some time with them. And then when they, they are going, they give them some package of either product to, to sell in their location. And from that, they start buying some small accessories and start doing the processing 
before they, they get the equipment. And also the government and the authorities are having some other way, I think, to get funding because they have noticed that it's really a very, very important human capital lying down in those villages that uh, they think uh, this activity can help to empower and make them to be more uh, occupied in those villages. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, turn the microphone over to Shek. Uh, he'd like to interject something. So Shek, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone, do you hear me? <laughs> yes, we got you, Shek, thank you, go ahead. All right, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Just to, to say that, you know, the question is very important, you know, especially in the, and youth training, and uh, I think this could be something that we could strengthen our between Niger and Senegal, because actually, even in ITA, we are we are we are we are, we are the training center that has been funded to give us have the fund from African Development Bank, you know, in order now to build some uh, space now that belong to ITA only for training and. And in this in this in this program, we are we are just looking on on youth and uh, and women, and that's why I say it's very important this part, you know, to implement it, you know, because it's it's, it's a big problem actually for the government, and I think the project would work on that, uh, on getting this youth and, and women trained. Thank you. Great, thank you. Other questions from the. Uh... Uh, or uh, any additional contributions to Sheck's point? I really wonder whether we should like start uh, uh, implement some startup kits for young people like Mustafa described a little bit but if we could strengthen that further to really encourage young people to engage uh, here in a in business and income generating activity. Okay, certainly something to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Bettina. Other questions and observations? Well, okay, I'll, I'll take the, the um, microphone. From my perspective, Bruce, I've got a hypothesis, Bruce and team and Mustafa on the extruder. I don't believe that the extruded products will ever be economically viable without subsidization from a project like SMIL. What can you do to prove me wrong? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, you know, I would, I, there needs to be another kind of, I guess another kind of study it could maybe doesn't have to be a large one to see how much people would pay in a market play, in the market for these kind of instant products. And it might be different from Niame to, to uh, Dakar, for instance. Let me just stop you there, Bruce. That study was already done by um, my student. I mean, we have yeah. the, that information is already available. Yeah. So yeah, I do know that. Yeah, it was, it was done. So, um, I don't know, Tim. I don't know that. I don't. I, you know. I think that uh, maybe Di again, maybe Dakar is a different kind of market where there would be a higher amount. But we're doing that in these year too. You know, the extruder. I mean, it's you know, like, like Madame Limon's unit. Um, she produces. You know, she well, she has equipment that is of the scale, of the price range of the extruder. It's not that the extruder is like totally out of whack, but uh, maybe it also, I don't know. I really, I don't know the, the complete answer to that. It could be that um, once consumers become more acquainted with instant products, that then they become more willing to pay for them. But I don't, you know, that's, that's just a thought. But that's a good point, Bruce. I mean, just to build on that a little bit, I think, Tim, you make a good point, but 
academically going through this versus actually getting it in, getting a private sector person to have a different sense of urgency to actually develop a market are probably two separate things. Uh, that being said, I think finding proof that economically it might be something that people could buy into and then develop and optimize products um, the way they currently, so finding successful entrepreneurs who are willing to adopt the technology and move forward is key and then awareness of those types of products. So this is where in Dakar, you have some in the urban area of Dakar where you, you have exposure to some of these products, although not as diverse as other parts of Africa, there is an awareness of what instant is and it is a bit more developed market, but you know, how to prove you wrong. I think, I think a big first step might be to actually find uh, early adopters in the private sector that and spend time trying to do that to see if if enabling them to to innovate beyond the technology centers would be the first step that without that type of information I don't think we could ever tell you if it's going to be successful or not unless that type of approach is tried where, where real commercial products are put on the market and they're not fully created at the innovation centers. But I guess my, my big worry is that this is going to be a very interesting academic exercise. We're seven years into this extrusion experiment. And at the end of this program, um, I guess I, I worry that it's just going to end up dying. And yeah. I find that frustrating that there will not be any sub, uh, sustainable development impacts in the food uh, processing sector after this. Yeah, you, I think you. Make I just don't it, feel yeah. like that. You, you, the questions are not, and you have uh, even in Niger, you have the ability to ask these questions, to do basic, very simple investment analysis on the extruder. Right now, it looks like in your shop experiments, there was what a hundred CFA. Uh, so what is that? Uh, you know, a hundred CFA premium that was placed upon the products. Is that enough to cover those additional capital costs of that extruder? Well, right. I don't think at the volumes that you're producing and selling. Yeah. I, so I, 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 yeah. I, this yeah. is what frust frustrates me at this point in time with this project. Yeah, but if we also consider the fact that, you, you know, I know that we're working in Niger, working in, in Senegal is different, but overall, when you look at the food industry, adoption of new technology takes time. And that's the same in the U.S. as it is in Europe, as it is anywhere. Um, I mean, people have been working on microwave technologies for 50 years, and it's only now being adopted uh, in, the, in the United States for large-scale production of certain high-value products. It doesn't mean that the technology is bad and it won't be successful. It's just that the capital investments to put in, people don't want to change when they have a technology that works. So there is a little bit of those headwinds in the industry overall. Uh, and I, I think Bruce is right in the sense of once you show what you can do that's different with this technology and create new categories of products, that might be where you, you see more interest in adoption from the private sector as opposed, you know, simple pre-cooked flowers have their value, but you know, what, what Mustafa's done in making the Fora and some of the other products that are different and unique, uh, they have some tie to traditional, but the extruder allows people to make things that are different. I think that's where you might start seeing some interest in adopting uh, this technology when you can give people something new that 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 you have evidence consumers like. Uh, so I mean, it's it's. It, I think we have to keep moving along, but I think trying to find the uh, a, an outcome of this would be to find the private sector person that's really going to adopt and, and maybe go into it themselves in, in in phase two as opposed to just subsidizing it. Hey Tim, can't we bring together? Can't we bring together your willingness to pay uh, results that your student did uh, with uh, some budgets of uh, uh, alternative enterprises operating at different scales and sourcing their extruders from different areas, for example, cheaper Chinese, perhaps if they exist, cheaper Chinese extruders and operating at different volumes. And at what point uh, would you have a a profitable enterprise again uh, uh, confronting it with your willingness to pay results I think that's, a, that's an obvious way to go um, as, a, as a starting point I mean it would at so least the, be I able guess to the question to to Mustafa and his team is that something yeah. that 
uh, Yaya is interested in pursuing. He would be the logical person to, to tackle such investment analyses. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tim. As regard to the extruder, I think uh, uh, the observation made by uh, Mario are very close to really what we're thinking to be the, the way and also what you have mentioned. Because the biggest things of this extruder in terms of, I think, advantages, it shortened the process time of making tool and uh, fura. Even last uh, February when we had a big workshop, they told us that right now in urban area, the women, if we take like uh, two, not every woman can successfully make a traditional tool to his uh, husband or household. And they have noticed that the uh, instant flour made from that extruder, whatever is your experience in uh, preparing a tool, you can uh, succeed in making it. So th this is something that they have discovered and also the way it is so easy for them to make. And uh, also they mention all these organoleptic properties about the tool. And if we come to the Fura, this is the first time they have seen an equipment that can make a food in the village. And in the cities, most of the people like, and the product is completely what they are expecting, which means that it is going to solve a big problem for the urban processing of sorghum and millet. Because right now the limitation is really the, the uh, production capacity is a very big challenge. They have a lot of demand of making dege, of making uh, uh, flowers, like uh, mektuo and also pura and some other products, but they are always being limited by the mechanization. But can I jump Most in are, Mustafa? Can I, I think yes. th those things are, are, um, are clear from the food like technology side but what they're what tim is bringing up and peter which are highly valid um is that we need to with yaya we need to talk with him you know uh because he's the guy who can do it as tim says to do this kind of budgeting out and figuring out the cost of operation maybe in some different scenarios of different kind of um, entrepreneur processing units, and you know how much it's going to cost, you know, in those different units. And Yaye, yeah, let's let's talk to Yaye about that. And, yeah, and yeah. Bruce definitely. and Mustafa, I think we can just get together and have a, a video conference and discuss this. I don't want to be labored anymore, but with what you presented, <laughs> okay. I'm just I uh, I'm not convinced especially when you have a 20 cent premium right now on the products in your market test for extruded um, and you it's one third of the volume of the total of those processed products i guess my back of the envelope and my mind just sitting here just says that doesn't seem to be too yeah. persuasive to me yeah but let me say that that 100 cfa that was not what you're saying that was for the processors who were in the study as uh, to when that was their sort of payback for being part of the study. So okay, that right. one. So again, I'm not clear on, on all the parameters involved, yeah. but I think we really need to, 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 to do a, a more uh, rigorous analysis of this basic question. Yes, I let's agree. Follow up at, let's, not, uh, let's not monopolize the conversation now. Okay. Uh, I, okay. Sheck, I agree you, completely. Yeah. yeah. Sheck, Sheck, you have something to contribute, please? Check, we don't hear you yet. There you go. Still muted, Check. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, say a little bit about that, that, uh, you know, 
I think the exclusion is something that, that would have a very, a very uh, broad future, you know what I'm saying? Because actually, if, a, if you compare here in Senegal, and I'm sure that it, it would be uh, at some point in Niger, because people now, if even in the, in, the, in the city, people are more likely uh, time, the time now is a big problem. And actually, if you, if you go even in the rural area, you know, people are asking about quick food because everyone now is, is running behind some stuff. And at some, at some point, they just want something very quick. And, uh, and the problem is people, they want it, but they, the, the price is, is, one, is one of the problems. So, and I think by working on, on trying to get some products, you know, like monitoring, like the team was saying, monitoring the price and things, I think we, we find a market because people are really interesting, uh, you know, in the urban as well as, as, well as in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rural area. Good, thanks for that observation. Barbara has a question about how do you factor in improved availability of protein from extruded products in a cost benefit study? And so I think it's a, a, an element of the overall price um, and um, the question is whether or not consumers are willing to pay for improved protein content. In mm. the work that Tabila did on vitamin uh, uh, fortification, he found that that wasn't one of the highest priorities of consumers. The um, nutritional safety, and uh, as was sort of encompassed in, a, in, a, in an expiration date, a date of production, was more important information for consumers than whether or not it was uh, fortified to have a higher, I think it was vitamin A or vitamin C, I can't remember which one it was. So mm -hmm. you'd have to put that in front of producers, put a product out there, this is more nutritious to you, and determine whether or not they'd be willing to pay for that additional, additional nutritional content. And I, I think my uh, reading of it is that those are often very difficult messages to convince consumers uh, that it's something worthwhile <coughs> to pay for. Yeah, I I uh, I see your point definitely in the urban market. I would say it's quite different in the rural, and of course these are not extruded products again in the rural area, and they're inexpensive, and and uh, that's a different situation because uh, people are buying them for for their nutritional uh, benefit because they're being fed to children, and they it's connected with health centers. <coughs> see some kind of result out of it. But I think it's a very valid point, Tim, in an urban area, how, what's, if that's really uh, the nutritional improvement, um, how consumers, urban consumers see that. <coughs> Maybe not so great. In Kenya, we find with the other uh, FPIL that there's a very uh, much more awareness of nutrition and commercial products in urban areas. Than I, than I see in West Africa. Great, thank you. Are there any last questions? We're getting close to our end time. It's been a very rich discussion. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. We will have another presentation in about uh, 12 minutes. So I'd like to at least uh, wrap this up if we can, so we can all take a break. Well, it doesn't look so. So I want to thank Bruce and his team for their presentation this morning. A lot of exciting information and a lot of challenging questions ahead that uh, you have.